We haven't done this for a few weeks, I've been away. Let's see if I can remember how to do it. Right, uh, the topic is the blood supply to the large bowel, um, which means we're gonna have to briefly remind ourselves of what the large bowel is, uh, look at the abdominal aorta, the major branches from that, talk a little bit about midgut, hindgut, but the main focus will be following the branches of the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery to the large bowel looking at those branches, the anastomoses, and talking about the watershed area. Yeah, I can still do this. I remember how to do this. <laughs> mm. Okay then. Um, we're gonna be down here in the abdomen, right? Okay, so that's the greater omentum hanging from the greater curvature of the stomach. Let's take that off. Um, I'm going to have to take the ribs off to, um, to get at everything anyway, right? So here's the small intestine. The small intestine is surrounded by the large intestine. Now, we use words like large intestine, large colon, large bowel. This large tube here um, is the large colon. Let's have a look at that. So we've got the cecum down here, the ascending colon, the uh, hepatic flexure, this right angle change, or the right colic flexure, the transverse colon, which has a mesentery, um, and then over on the side of the spleen, we have the splenic flexure, or the left colic flexure, where the transverse colon becomes the descending colon. And what we'll see when we take this apart is that the descending colon becomes the sigmoid colon and becomes the rectum. So uh, large bowel includes all of that. Uh, the term large intestine includes all of that. Large colon includes all of that except for the rectum, right? So as far as the sigmoid colon, eh, I know pedantics, but we're like that in anatomy. Um, so I'm probably gonna use the term large bowel throughout this. Anyway, right, let's take the small bowel out and try and leave the transverse colon in place. And what you can see immediately is all of these lovely blood vessels. There's that sigmoid colon there. Now, I'll take the bowel out and then we'll put it back again in a minute. But if we take the bowel out, you can now see the posterior abdominal wall. You can, you can see the major blood vessels. So here's the aorta. There's the heart, the aorta comes out of the heart, arches over to the left and posteriorly, it descends through the thorax, passes through the diaphragm, sneaks around the back of it, appears in the abdomen, so this is now just called the abdominal aorta, descends through the abdomen and ends here, where it divides into the left and right common iliac arteries. And what we see are one, two, three anterior branches from the abdominal aorta and those three abdominal branches, sorry, those th yeah, three anterior abdominal aortic branches, oh, what a lot of A's, they will all supply blood to the bowel. Embryologically, we talk about the bowel as foregut, midgut, and hindgut because it starts off as a simple tube which gets longer and longer and longer, but each region of that early simple tube is either supplied with blood by the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, or the inferior mesenteric artery. So foregut, midgut, and hindgut. Today, when we're looking at the blood supply to the large bowel, we're thinking about midgut and hindgut, and we're thinking about the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. So we will look at the branches of these and how they're connected. Now, if I put the large bowel back on, uh, something else that's worth mentioning is that the gastrointestinal tract was a tube that had a mesentery and as the bowel has developed, some of it still has a mesentery and some of it doesn't. That's what I mean by the transverse colon here having a mesentery, the transverse mesocolon. What that means in practice is that the uh, transverse colon is the most mobile part. The ascending colon and the descending colon are fixed in place. They get described as secondarily retroperitoneal. That is, they had a mesentery, but they've been pulled back and fixed in place against the abdominal wall. The reason I mention this here is because it does 
affect how you think about how the blood vessels pass to the large bowel because the mesentery is the route by which the blood vessels, the nerves and the lymphatics get from the posterior abdominal wall to the colon, right? So just bear that in mind as we're looking at this. But this will be very visual because we can see lots of great things here, um, which I've just hidden by putting the transverse colon back on. But in terms of um, where does the midgut become the hindgut, it's around here. Um, so the midgut includes the small bowel, the, co the, the cecum, we've got the appendix down here as well, the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure, and you know, about two thirds of the transverse colon. Then the hindgut is the remainder of the transverse colon, um, the splenic flexure, descending colon, sigmoid colon, uh, rectum. And we'll see that reflected in and defined by the arteries that supply blood to the large bowel, right? Right, let me take this off just so we can see. Okay then, this is fun. Here's the pancreas, here's the duodenum. We see these two blood vessels here. Uh, this is the superior mesenteric artery. So if I take this off, you can see the superior mesenteric artery is there. It's also there. So if I put this back on again, keep an eye on that. There's the superior mesenteric artery appearing from between the pancreas and the duodenum. So it's running anteriorly out between those two guys. So it's a good landmark, right? The duodenum is also retroperitoneal, so it's fixed in place. So, you know, most of the bowels moving around, these are pretty fixed landmarks. So there's the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesenteric vein. I think I'll probably talk about the veins next week. Um, and as it pops out here, hmm, it gives off a number of branches. Now, as, it, as the superior mesenteric artery, this down here, you see those little branches coming off it. Well, those are all going to the small bowel. So we can't see those today, but I know that this branch here is gonna loop around and be continuous with this branch here. And I can see the last part of the small intestine, the ileum or the ileum, passing into the cecum there. So this will be the ilio, well, let's say this here is the iliocolic artery because it's supplying blood to the colon and to the ileum or ileum or iliocolic artery, whatever you like. Um, and then the superior mesenteric artery is gonna give an iliocolic artery, it's gonna give a right colic artery, and it's gonna give a middle colic artery. So the right colic artery is gonna supply blood to the ascending colon. So that'll be certainly, you know, this branch here. Um, this always looks a little bit different in different textbooks, in different people. There's, there's a bit of variability here, right? But iliocolic artery, right colic artery, and then the middle colic artery. Well, where's that going? Can you see it here? So the middle colic artery is going to the transverse colon, and that's it there. And look, it's given off two branches, right and left, um, to supply blood to the transverse colon. So the superior mesenteric artery is here. It gives off a middle colic artery, right colic artery, and ileocolic arteries. Now, here's the fun bit. <laughs> So uh, there's our transverse colon. If we lift it up, we've got a mesentery, we can do that. As I said, there's a, a left branch and a right branch, but look how that right branch connects to the right colic artery, and look how the left branch runs around to, spoiler, but there's gonna be a left colic artery on the left side, um, but this also connects to the left colic artery. And do you see how there is uh, like an artery running all the way around next to the large bowel? That's the marginal artery, also known as the marginal artery of Drummond. Uh, and it's this marginal artery that's actually receiving branches from these colic arteries, which are branches from the superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery, and then supplying blood to the large bowel through these, um, these straight branches. So we have these straight arteries or these uh, ar arteri recti, right? Straight artery, artery. Um, and this marginal artery is linking up all these other branches. Anyway, that's the superior mesenteric artery. Where's the, uh, where's the inferior mesenteric artery? Bom, bom, bom. The inferior mesenteric artery, remember, 
comes from the aorta a fair bit further down. That's its cut edge there. Let's put this back on. There it is. So there's the inferior mesenteric artery there. And look, again, it's giving off a number of branches. As I said, this here is the left colic artery, which is going to supply blood to the descending colon and to the, the splenic flexure, the left colic flexure. So the branches of the inferior mesenteric artery are going to be the left colic artery and then sigmoid arteries to the sigmoid colon there. And this running back towards the rectum is the superior rectal artery because yes, there are other rectal arteries, middle and inferior, which we'll talk about. But if we look at the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery, and then we look at that, for example, we look at the, the middle colic artery running up here and into the marginal artery. And then we look at the inferior mesenteric artery, the left colic artery, and it sending branches into the marginal artery. Can you see how the left colic artery and the middle colic artery are linked? This is an anastomosis. This is a link between blood vessels. Sometimes this is confusing to understand when we see these arcades because it looks like the blood just flows around in circles, but you've got to remember that the blood is flowing into the marginal artery and then out from the marginal artery into the colon through capillary beds and out the other side into the venous system. So it's not just a flow around the arcade. The blood is flowing in and out and across the tissues, right? But the marginal artery links the middle colic artery and the left colic artery. Therefore, it also links the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. This is a significant anastomosis. Now, that superior rectal artery then is a branch from the inferior mesenteric artery, right? Let me take this off. I said that the aorta ends as the left and right common iliac arteries. And uh, as that descends, that ends as the external and internal iliac arteries. And the internal iliac artery will go into the pelvis. The middle rectal artery is a branch of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. The inferior rectal artery is a branch of the pudendal artery, which is the terminal end of the anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery. Um, the superior, middle, and inferior rectal artery supply blood to the rectum. There are more anastomoses between those arteries in the rectum, which means that there is also an anastomosis, a link between the internal iliac artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. Worth remembering. All right then, now here is the fun clinical bit, uh, the watershed area of the large bowel. So we said that the um, hindgut and the midgut, or the midgut becomes the hindgut, about here, right? Um, at the left colic flexure, the splenic flexure of the large bowel. Um, and we see that the superior mesenteric artery supplies blood to this tissue, and the inferior mesenteric artery supplies blood to this tissue, and that there are anastomoses. So in theory, this is very helpful. If one of these arteries becomes blocked, becomes occluded, or becomes narrowed, for example, by atherosclerosis, or uh, a thrombus, you know, a clot, or whatever, there is, theoretically, potentially, an alternate route that blood can flow to to continue to supply blood to the tissue. Great, anastomoses are great, we love these. However, this part of the bowel here is at the end of both potentially fairly long arteries, right? Um, supplying a lot of blood to a significant organ, which means that if the blood pressure as a whole drops after trauma with a lot of blood loss, after you know, severe surgery with a lot of blood loss, after heart failure, um, you know, anything you can think of where the blood pressure drops to dangerous levels, this region of the large bowel becomes at risk of ischemia. Sometimes this is chronic, sometimes this is acute. Um, uh, you know, and that is really, really risky. It'll give abdominal pain, it'll give signs, 
but the bowel could die, the bowel could perforate. Uh, those things lead to death, right? Um, so this is dangerous. So this gets called the watershed area because when the blood pressure drops to low levels, um, the perfusion of blood to this region of the large bowel um, falls because the blood is going through these long arteries, through all these other blood all these other branches and all these other capillary beds to supply blood to these tissues. So if the pressure isn't high enough, it's not pushed all the way into the watershed area. So on the one hand, we have these anastomoses, we have these links, but on the other hand, we have this uh, problematic watershed area. Okay, how's that? That is the anatomy of the blood supply to the large bowel. It looks complicated, because it kind of is, you know, there's lots of little branches and stuff. So um, me picking how to label this is a bit of a challenge. And yes, it is a little bit variable, but that principle of superior and inferior mesenteric arteries and those major branches and that marginal artery connecting all of this and sending the branches out to the large bowel, that's the crux of it, right? Um, and we'll look at the venous drainage um, another time, maybe next week. Anyway, I hope that was useful. Uh, see you next week. Well, I'm supposed to be traveling next week as well. I'll see what I can do.